Welcome back to another episode of Focus on EDU. So excited for us to be back talking a little bit about virtual reality or VR in education today. Uh, I'm so excited we have our guest here. We're gonna dive right into the episode. So let's start off, uh, give us your name, uh, what you do, and a little bit about your background with education. Thanks so much, Doug, for having me. Uh, I'm uh, Anarupa, the founder and CEO of Prisms. And uh, to give you a little bit of a background of what brought me to this junction in my life, um, my entry point to education was as a high school math and physics teacher in the Boston Public Schools. Uh, and after leaving the classroom, I served in a few different district uh, leadership capacities um, as a secondary uh, math director in the city of Boston, um, then moved over to New York City to do similar work across professional learning and curriculum uh, in the New York City DOE. Uh, and then most recently, I was Dean of Math and Engineering at Success Academies, which is a, a charter network in the New York City area. And I kind of, what I learned at the end of that is um, as um, well-intentioned um, uh, as our tools, learning tools are today, they're orthogonal to how we know people teach and learn math best. And so that really is what triggered um, my founding of PRISMS to build a whole new paradigm for math education that's aligned to everything that learning science has told us over the years, but we just didn't have the technologies to scale um, until now. Absolutely. Well, fellow high school teacher, so I knew I liked you for a reason, uh, <laughs> but, but let's get right to it. So PRISMS VR, right, is the company. So VR itself, uh, let's talk about virtual reality. It's had a little bit of a checkered past with education, I feel like. Uh, definitely yeah. had some some bumps in the road, especially when it comes to like mainstream or core education classes. So why do you think that is? I think as I did my um, kind of review of the market when I, when I started Prisms, what I found was that VR was being used to recreate things that are already possible in the physical world, but it was just a worse version of it. So this is like, well, let's go view the pyramids. Let's go on this. Um, let's let's let 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 let's go do a, a science experiment um, in VR. And and the fact, those are not bad applications. But the reason I the reason I named them um, is because those are basically recreating. Um, physical situations that you can go and experience, but it's, but it's in VR, so it's not as powerful an experience. And what I found to be the real power of VR is to create tactile experiences and first-person experiences that you actually cannot recreate, um, because that creates a much, much, much stronger value proposition for a new modality of learning. And more importantly, really thinking about is the issue that um, we don't have a way to do science labs. Is, is that like the pain point in education? Or is a pain point, for example, what, what we've started to look at is that people don't know how to abstract up from, um, from real world experiences and create more abstract representations in the case of math, mathematical models. So not to kind of stray too far from your question and, and get into what we're doing at PRISMS, but what I, what I essentially found was that VR applications weren't necessarily getting at the core pain points in um, in learning today, and they weren't scaling pedagogies that teachers were like, ah, I, if only I could do this, we would get, you know, multiplicative growth on outcomes. People, I, I looked at the applications and said, ah, this is cool. It's cool tech. It's, it's fun to kind of be in there. But no part of me was, was said that if we can implement these solutions in the classroom, we're going to fundamentally transform how people learn and, and therefore the outcomes that we get for our kids. So do you feel like now, as we've addressed some of those things, as, as new things have come out, are we now at a point where you feel like those either those core education classes are ready for VR or VR is ready for the core? And if yes, why now? And if not, when do you think we'll be there? Yeah, I think there are a few pieces to that. Um, what I didn't discuss at all was the kind of where we are with hardware, right? For, so for, for the last you know 10 years, um, we just didn't have a, a proliferation of standalone headsets. So any VR device had to be connected by a wire to a clunky piece of hardware. That makes it really difficult to implement in the classroom because you have, you know, you have your desk, desktop or your, or your bulky kind of high computing power laptop connected to each device, which both tethers a student, so it limitation, li limits movement, um, but it also uh, just makes the startup costs much more expensive. I think, beyond just the hardware becoming easier to use, um, software technique, techniques having grown tremendously. So that just comfort, design, UI, all of that is just, you get into a VR headset today, 
um, there's just much, much, much higher levels of comfort. And a lot of our kids and teachers have said things like, I had no idea. Like I used to get so nauseous when I used to get in. And I said, yeah, I used to feel nauseous because locomotion was a, was a tactic that people used a lot where the environment would move towards you. And that's really the root cause of what makes people sick in or makes people feel sick in VR. But if you can be the one that's controlling your movement, which is very much the direction towards which VR design and development have gone for accessibility considerations, um, you're gonna feel a lot more comfortable. So the first one was just the hardware is much easier to use. Second is just the software techniques and design, um, the evolution of design for it to be a much more comfortable environment. Um, and the third is what we were trying to get at, which is now people are really focused on scaling learning design. So in the, in the case of like what we're focused on is how do people acquire a mathematical idea better? And that is the, uh, the problem statement or the challenge we're solving versus world building, you know, which is like, let's just create great new worlds and let's make that monkey look incredible. Let's make that leaf. And, and so the focus has gone from just aesthetics and making kind of a world look perfect and more around if a person needs to learn quadratic functions better, if a person needs to understand this concept better, um, how do we use multimodal, tactile, kinesthetic, and visual interactions to do so, which I think is a much, much better way to think about the modulation of the medium. So these three things run hardware techniques, software, as well as a much more focused product approach, um, I think is going to just be transformative for VR. And the last thing I, I would just add as an asterisk or a note is price point. I think that with the, with the, with the Oculus Quest 2, um, you know, price points are, are around $300 a headset that's commensurate to a Chromebook. Um, and it has, it's so much more powerful than a Chromebook in terms of what a child is able to experience and what a teacher is able to, um, how they're able to elevate their, their practice. Um, as we see hand tracking and gaze tracking and, and, you know, the next generation of the Quest and the Pico and as, you know, Apple drops their first um, headset uh, and device into the market, we're just going to continue to see huge, huge evolution of, of natural interfaces. Um, which will, again, continue to allow us to innovate um, better and better learning design. All right. So I'm going to grab one of the things that you just mentioned, right? So quadratic formula. I know Prisms is is built around the, the math piece, especially the part that you talked about that's launched so far. Um, get, maybe give me an example if it's not quadratic formula, but if I take my headset right now, right? And I happen to be um, in a class that was using it, how would that be different, right? Learning math using something like prisms versus um, e either using something that was in the past or just using uh, traditional methods and resources? So typically, uh, we started with algebra because it's the Achilles heel of the secondary STEM program. You know, about 70% of US eighth and ninth graders lack proficiency in algebra. And it's been, it's been something we've just actually poured money into. Uh, with zero uh, ROI, and I, and I mean zero, like they've been, the results have been pretty stagnant across our country. Um, and that's primarily, I can only share my, my hypothesis around why that is. Uh, it's because the learning arc that kids have been using to learn that fundamentally hasn't been disrupted. So whether it was digital or print, kids typically learned algebraic concepts as such. They began with the form of an equation. Uh, it was typically divorced from any sort of personal relevance. They then will memorize kind of uh, properties about that. So let's just take the case of exponential functions. It was the first module we built. Kids will begin with memorizing the form Y is equal to five to the X. They then memorize uh, properties. The outputs have a common factor and they'll just kind of start parroting um, um, properties of that, of that mathematical concept. They then begin to memorize if then statements. If you see, you know, growth rate of five, that means your A is equal to five. If you see um, it starts with one person, that means this variable in your equation is, is one. So you're just kind of memorizing if then uh, reactions, and then you practice that over and over again on drill and kill. So, and that's what's happening with kids coming out of the pandemic right now of, of uh, kids are 12 to 14 months behind in math. What do we do? Let's give them double dose tutoring. Let's give them double dose drill and kill. And guess what? Nothing's changing because you can't give them more of what they, what they were doing before and expect a change. So to your direct question around, if this is the learning arc today of how people go from memorizing a mathematical construct and symbolic notation, and then just kind of practicing that, how, um, how does prisms differ? Well, Rather than beginning with an equation, in our model, students begin with an experience because we know that we learn through experiences. Um, the, the experiences are perceptual, so they're, you, you, you're, you're moving, you're seeing. Um, so kids start in a food hall. 
um, once they put their headsets on and um, they're you know buying their food, taking in the environment, no no kind of we're not seeing exponential growth, we're not seeing multiplicative growth. Um, they're they're just experiencing an environment. Um, there's a mayor's announcement. She says, hey, there's an alarming growth rate of a virus. Stay safe and stay tuned. And the kids get a superpower on their watch to go back into time and see when I was just hanging out, how was the virus spreading? So kids are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea when she sneezed, there was trans transmission. When she walked back, another five people got it. So it's a physical understanding of multiplicative growth, not an intellectual one. Um, kids then accept their mission. How many weeks until the hospitals in your community are going to reach capacity? And it's through that mission. So we're not game driven. That's something that's very important. When people typically hear VR, they think of kind of addiction loops and gamification tactics and We've really steered clear of that, of how do you build conviction and purpose that is much more intrinsic, that goes beyond like giving them coins and colors and, and things that are, in my, in my view, pretty transient um, in terms of a, a person's lifelong learning. And so it's through that question, how many weeks until your hospitals are going to need more resources, um, that they connect that physical understanding of multiplicative growth through a 3D simulation. They then connect that to a tactile data visualization where they could kind of see the, the, the people organized into weeks. They were going to see that structural growth of exponential functions. They then connect that to tables to create their own tables. They create um, and uh, find the expressions and then generalize to the equation. So if you look at that through line of going from a real world problem to going up layers of abstraction from 3D representations to 2D representations and finally the 1D representation, that's a we basically flipped it on its head, right? And what we've been finding is that when uh, kids are generating or deriving these mathematical models from their body, the, the way that they're retaining, the way that the rest of the unit of study is anchored in that learning moment has been really, really powerful. So I'll, I'll pause there, uh, but I hope that kind of gave you a bit of a juxtaposition of, you know, how kids learn today versus how we're thinking about experience to abstraction in pr at prisms. So in that example, right, how much of that is, is just that initial piece happening in VR, right? So the part where they're talking about the, uh, the physical spread and they're going into the food hall and they get the mission on their watch. Is that when it then steps back into the, the traditional classroom or does that continue the experience within there? No, I mean, you, how do you create a tactile data visualization? Um, you know, that that's a lot of math manipulatives for teachers to be kind of creating the night before. So we've the entire second part of the mathematization happens in VR as well, where kids get to use multimodal table tools, equation editors, data visualization tools, embodied graph, 3D writing tools to annotate your bar graphs. We've created a whole world of math problem solving that you know really keeps the the tactile nature of math learning that we have at the k k5 level but kind of disappears as kids get older we really wanted to inject that back into the secondary math classroom so part one and part two both happen in vr and then we provide our our educators a number of offline materials that allow kids to then do that math that they did fully in vr but translate it to paper pencil because assessments again are still either via a 2d computer interface or um a uh, paper pencil so we want to make sure that, that that connective tissue is provided by us to to teachers and schools yeah, well, anytime more of the resources can be can be built in there, obviously it's better for the teachers, right, who who need to bring this then and make those connections into the classroom. So shockingly, we're actually getting close on time. So <laughs> if people want to learn more, whether it's about VR, whether it's about prisms, you know, what are some resources, blogs, books, folks that um, are doing incredible work in the field? Uh, you know, what are some things that people should go to uh, if they want to learn? So for Prisms, it's really easy. You can go to our website, uh, prismsvr.com. Uh, for other folks um, who who I follow and I find their insights really valuable, uh, Craig Freilich, he has a, a podcast that um, he's an educator, a very forward-thinking educator that looks at the various applications of virtual reality in scaling different types of pedagogies across disciplines. So we are very focused on math and science at present. Um, I think I think it's the biggest pain point, the biggest area where mathematical models are just kind of thrown upon kids. Um, so that's our niche. But Craig really looks at VR across the curriculum, um, and he's a great resource and friend. Um, then there's Kent By Voices of VR. His podcast is is one of the um, the kind of frontier pioneer 
thinking of what is really the future of VR, what's great now, where, where, where is the field headed? So I would, I would recommend um, both of them. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, this was a great conversation. I can't wait to dive in and learn more. Like I said, we get, we get so many questions when we're working with schools about how are we going to bring this into our classroom in a meaningful way? Yeah. You know, we are building out algebra. We've built out algebra, geometry, middle school math, high school algebra two, algebra based biology, chemistry, physics, like that, that the more that we focus VR on supplementing core instruction and really getting at the root of fragilities in, 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 in the core, you're going to have less and less of a divergence around who uses it because VR and in, in, in many emerging technologies have typically had a huge equity issue. And you have an equity issue because it's like this niche thing that's used for these small parts of schooling and curriculum, whereas PRISMS is focused on core math and science. So I just want to kind of want to like have that ribbon be what, what, what ties um, like my message and, and mission is that this, that it has to be a part of the core teacher training and teacher support is at the, is at the center of scaling a new emerging technology. And that's what we're really focused on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as we move through this, right, the other exciting part is that, yes, we've got more and more better resources that are being created like prisms, but we also have schools that are starting spatial computing programs where they're now rather than just consuming the content, right? They're creating their own uh, 3D content because that is obviously something that's really important as we move forward into the future. So thank Absolutely. you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can be notified whenever we post new content. Looking forward to seeing you next time.